Mau Maui. You can you can make fun of me anytime. I don't care. As long as, as, long as things are working out, as long as you're kind of fair to me and all the other things you do, you can make fun of me all you want. <laughs> so yeah, I, we need to update. I I got some good news and things are going well. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, everybody, um, we're going to go ahead and get started, so come on, take your seats. So Nels went and saw Tibbetts. Uh, flying machine yesterday, yeah, so they had a, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool, so, what, yeah, he's pretty close, he's, yeah, he's doing a human-powered drone, it's kind of cool, so, it's like something you can wear, so, yeah, I think he does, he's, oh, it's not, it's not there yet, but, uh, I think we should, we should, I'm volunteering, I was going to say, let's find something skinny, You got all ages here tonight, Nels. So. Okay, let's. Um, if you guys could come on in, let's get let's get started. And I promise you, you'll have plenty of time to chat afterwards. So I've I've got a couple general announcements this week. So first of all, welcome to Rain. So thank you guys for coming. Yeah, I know it's. I know it's Veterans Day, um, and, and so it's a little smaller crowd than usual, but I really appreciate you coming out. Um, you can celebrate here. Um, so just will anybody who hasn't been to Rain before, doesn't know what we're all about, they're just coming just because they know Nels or something like that, come talk to me or come talk to anybody at Rain, and I'll, uh, we can take you up, take you through their labs, and, and uh, teach you a little bit about what we do. Um, so, so in general, general uh, I got I to basically thank our sponsors for this series. So uh, CenturyLink, Russell Family Foundation, Ferguson Architecture, and Sprague uh, to, to really put this series on. Uh, this is something we do once a month uh, on the second uh, Monday of every month. And uh, we have a ton of community partners, and we want to thank everybody. Uh, for, for that, and this, is, this has been really helpful uh, getting uh, for our outreach. Um, and then I also want to talk about uh, iGEM. So everybody knows what iGEM stands for, the Internationally Genetically Engineered Machine. It's kind of like a household word around here. So this is a science fair that our high school kids uh, compete in once a year. Uh, there's some alumni members here. We don't have any of uh, the students here, but like Brendan was, was in the past. Um, and, and so we have, uh, that's a team that goes to MIT and competes. And so we came back with a bronze medal this year. Um, it was a, a project on rhizobium, kind of synthetically improving. So, so nitrogen fixation, it was really good. Oh, we got some mentors here, the wiki. Uh, there's a lot of things, environmental outpack. And one of the coolest things, uh, uh, they won the best biosafety and biosecurity escape game. And this is pretty amazing given that we're kind of a DIY incubator and there's a lot of three-letter agencies that kind of are nervous about us. But here we are coming in with the best biosafety and biosecurity. I thought it was great. So the FBI loved us. Um, so our next speaker, I just want to put this out there, is Dr. Martin Latterish. And uh, Mary Lynn knows it. Nels knows Martin. He's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, uh, he was uh, Illumina, uh, Bioscale, um, just an incredibly interesting guy, and uh, he's flying up here from San Diego to give a talk. Um, and so you guys, if you know anybody, if you want to start a company, if you started a company, uh, if you want to talk about inventions, uh, this is the guy uh, you want to talk to. Um, so I want to introduce Nels. So Nels is actually a very good friend of a lot of people in this room. Uh, he comes from an extremely diverse background. He's University of Washington. Uh, he is an Oregon person. Uh, and so uh, came started out with molecular probes in Corvallis, so in the old days of 
that I have, actually I pulled up a lot of stuff from the past. I have a bio for Nels, but what's, what's interesting is I have, I thought this might be useful because I actually have a bio from him when he was, this is years ago, like 2011, when he was at, uh, at, at when he was at Johns Hopkins APL. So he was basically uh, a funds manager. So anybody who's trying to fund a company, this is really, you know, Nels is somebody who has written, uh, you know, basically funded a lot of people. And, and so, so I was just looking at he. So first of all, he, incredibly diverse background, right? He works for Boeing now, but he's a chemist, right? And he's done a lot of biology. He's been connected with some of the biggest uh, breakthroughs in, in sequencing technology. And so he's really played a part in kind of inventing a lot of the, the setting the stage for a, uh, the synthetic bio uh, area, but really in molecular biology, um, he's, he's really one of our true inventors. Um, so he's an engineer, uh, analytical biochemistry, organic surface synthesis, and small volume sample preparation and processing. Remember this, Nels? Um, he also managed over 30 million in federal R&D and in excess of 66 million industrial scientific project content. So, you know, if you're thinking, you know, this is really somebody who has a ton of experience in really not just inventing, but also pushing dollars to, um, you know, projects that have a high, high chance of success. It's, it's perfect for what we're trying to do in this area um, and, and really creating something in biotech. And so I'm just super excited. Well, I'm excited that he's my friend. He crashes at my house, uh, brings his son and his wife down. But I'm also excited that he's excited about rain and, and really about developing um, kind of partners in this area, something that, you know, his connections could, could interact with and also uh, maybe even a company like Boeing. So I'm really excited about this. Um, so... Uh, you were a Fulbright, weren't you? You had a Fulbright? Yeah, he's Fulbright. He's just, uh, we'll talk about all his accomplishments later. He's just, he is an a, a exceptional person. He is one of my original superheroes of science. This is his third talk back. And, and actually, he's given four talks. And every time he gives original content. So uh, I have no idea what this talk is about. Well, I know a little bit. Okay. Uh, should I be stalling? Okay. 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 So I'm going to turn it over to Nels. Uh, and also, there'll be question and answers afterwards. I'm going to run around with the mic. And, um, and then after that, just feel free if you need to leave. But if you want to stay, stay as long as you want. Nels will be here to answer questions. Come up and talk with him. This is a person you really want to interact with. And actually, if you don't know a lot of people in the room, you want to spend talk time talking to them. Because part of this is really this... We want this space where we're going to have collisions and really come up with new ideas. And this is a place, I, I guarantee you, I am surrounded by people smarter than me in this room. And I'm excited about that. So thanks. Thanks. Thank you, David. It's always um, slightly irritating to hear about how successful I've been at raising money because that means that other people haven't been that really very likely deserved it more. And um, so you should um, complain to your uh, uh, congressmen and senators about how um, uh, people in fancy places like Johns Hopkins um, get the vast majority of the money. Uh, Johns Hopkins APL, where I used to work, um, pulls down a billion dollars a year in soft money, entirely soft money. They have no base funding at all from the federal government. They aren't an FFRDC. They aren't a federally funded research and development corporation. They're at UARC, which is a university associated research, research center. And those are lovely, right? Uh, but they pull in money so much faster than the rest of us possibly can, right? And um, so complain about people like me because it's bad. It's an odd way of looking at it, right? Um, but so uh, we've been working on a project to replace Halon 1301. And so anybody who's worked in the computer industry, anybody who's worked in the maritime industry, anybody who's worked in the aerospace industry knows that Halon 1301 is 
the stuff that we use to put out fires in places where people cannot easily exit or in places where we don't want residue, right? So a computer facility, you don't want residue. You don't want to spray something on the computer system that's going to completely destroy it while you're putting the fire out. That would be bad. You, um, on an airplane, you can't get off. Submarine can't get off. Spaceship can't get off. So you're going to want something in those. And ships generally also, you don't want to have to jump in the cold sea uh, if you've got a fire on board. And so we've been trying to replace Halon 1301 for all of these places because it is a potent ozone destroyer, right? It's half-life in the atmosphere is 65 years. So it's really a bummer. It's going to hang around for a long time. It sucks up ozone like crazy, and that's bad. We don't want to destroy the ozone layer because it's protecting us from UV, right? So if you... Uh, if you look at who uses it, this big triangle here is the maritime industry. And the next smaller triangle up, uh, or is the, uh, is the um, computer facility industry, and the next smaller one up is the maritime industry. And that little teeny triangle at the top is aviation and space. So we use almost none of it. So it would be logical to say, hey, look, you know, you're only responsible for 0.2% or something like that of the total halon usage in the world. Submarines, spacecraft, and, and, uh, and airplanes really ought to just keep using halon 1301. And that would be lovely, except the manufacturing of it was outlawed in 1994. So there's been no new Halon produced since 1994, except in a couple of countries that insist on breaking the rules. So nobody makes it, and we're using it up. Boeing has a big bank of Halon that we draw from, and it's going to be gone before we can get something else in place if we're not careful. And the aviation industry spent many, many years playing around with various different technologies to try to replace Halon with something that was effective, right? And uh, the library industry, some of you know that I was the chief scientist at the Library of Congress, um, the, um, the library industry doesn't want to spray water on books because that screws the books up, right? One book catches on fire, the firemen come in, they spray water all over the place. It's really a disaster in a library. So the libraries really wanted to find something to replace Halon, and they also wanted something that had no residue. And, but because they're on the ground and they don't have any mass requirements, it was easy enough for them to say, let's just put enough nitrogen in the building so that you can't support a flame. And if you've ever climbed a tall mountain, you'll know that without an oxygen source, you can't get your, your flame lit. You can't light a match. And so, but you can still breathe. So there's a safe zone for humans breathing, but uh, it still won't support a flame. And so the National Library in Norway, as an example, uses an oxygen scrubber to separate nitrogen, which is 70% of the atmosphere, from the oxygen that's in the atmosphere and pump the nitrogen into the library building and that makes it so that they can't support a flame. They have no other fire suppression system in the building, right? And everybody feels really good when they go home because they've got lots of oxygen, right? Uh, so it's a way of promoting days off. And uh, so the aviation industry is in trouble because uh, there's a real balance here between, and uh, we talked to some of you in the audience before the show here uh, about how there's a real balance, right? So if what we do reduces the amount of Halon 1301 that ends up being out in the world and potentially released, not necessarily, right? airplanes very, very rarely release Halon. They either have a fire and they release it, they release it in a crash, which generally doesn't happen, and 
or they release it by accident because some interlock was subverted by a mechanic working in the airplane or something like that. It's very, very rare that, that the aircraft ever re releases any halon. But if you want to reduce the total amount of halon that's out in the world and keep the ozone in place, you better replace it with something that weighs the same amount as halon does. Because if you don't, you're going to be carrying around all that extra weight on the airplane every time you take off and land, and that's going to cause a whole bunch of CO2, which is going to then promote global warming instead. So you're, you're, you're doing this, right? You're trying to balance between ozone depletion and CO2 production, and therein lies the rub. And the other rub is that halon is like a magic molecule. It's right in the right place in the periodic table, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the FAA and a group of folks that I sit on the task group for um, came up with a series of tests several years ago before I was on the task group to test to see whether or not they could make a good test for new agents that might come along and implement those. And one of the tests is an empty compartment test where they we built a compartment, which I'm going to talk to you guys about in a minute, where you just flood the compartment and make sure that you can get a concentration of some level, right? And the next one is an aerosol can burst test, which everybody thinks of as the hard one, where you've got a fire, you quell the fire with the halon system or with whatever system you've got to quell the fire with. The fire dies down, but it's not out. They're suppressants, they're not extinguishers, right? And because all that plastic luggage and sweatshirts and lingerie is really hard to put out. So um, you, uh, you, you, you then have a, a hairspray can in the same luggage and that hairspray, hair, hairspray can gets over temperature, it blows up, and now is the reduced concentration of the suppressant enough to keep you from having an overpressure event? Boom. Right? You don't want to overpressure your aircraft. That's bad form. Right? Uh, there's a jet A pan fire. You can imagine, you know, there's a leak in a fuel line someplace. It makes a little puddle of fuel somewhere in the bottom of the airplane. Can you put that out? Uh, a bulk load fire. You can't predict what people are going to carry onto airplanes. And I think everybody has seen the giant garbage can full of stuff that they take away from all of us at the TSA site, you know. Um, so that's the, just the stuff that they catch. There's all kinds of other things in there, right? And they're, most of them are flammable. And a lot of them are batteries. The big one right now is e-cigarette batteries. So people are like, yeah, I got to have the thing fully charged before I get on the airplane because when I get off, I'm going to need the nicotine really bad. And so then they put their fully charged device in their luggage, and it's hot. And now it's held adiabatically, which means that it's not cooling down and it drives the batteries in the e-cigarette over the verge and they uh, combust, right? They let out all their energy. So that's one that people are really worried about right now. But for the bulk load fire, they said FAA and Airbus and EASA and all the different agencies and so on that control air safety uh, worldwide agreed that boxes full of shredded paper would be the best fuel because it just goes up like gangbusters. And they were right. That was a great choice. It's way more flammable than anything that we might see on an aircraft. So that's the one we choose. That's the bulk load fire. And then we have the last one, which is a containerized fire. And if you look at containers, especially on cargo aircraft like um, the UPS and, and DHL and, and uh, FedEx planes, they all containerize everything, and then they put them all onto the airplane and roll them down into the fuselage through a door. And they're very handy. And they can be a great fire suppression system in and of themselves. So UP, I just came back from the FAA Triennial, and they have produced now 20,000 new containers to use on their aircraft, and they're going to buy another 20,000 uh, containers that are not metallic to uh, provide better fire suppression. And very interestingly, better durability. 
So the, the composite uh, LB3 containers are more durable than the aluminum ones. So they're lighter weight, they're more durable, and they're fire suppressing. So it's a win-win-win, and they're very excited about that. So you got to scrupulously document everything, and then you got to go back and check with the FAA over and over and over again because the document isn't clear. It was written by a committee 20 years ago, and it's, it's crazy bad. And, uh, and then you have to confirm the quality of your data with the task group when you're done. And we've done all that. So again, these four tests, the first, and these are the, these are the pencil drawings that are in the FAA document. They're so cute, I had to put them in there. Um, they're just somebody that, I, well, I used to teach organic chemistry, right? And I'd have all my students draw a cube, a three-dimensional representation of a cube, to see whether or not they could visualize things in three dimensions. And then I would grade all their cubes, and then I would compare them against their scores in the class. And it was really highly correlated, because people who can visualize things in three dimensions are really good at organic chemistry, because you have to be, right? And uh, clearly, the dude that did those at FAA was not good at chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the bulk load is 173 boxes. So you, got, you have to have a whole team of people making boxes. They need to make up all these boxes. They need to fill them all with shredded paper. And there's only one guy in the United States that still has an inline shredder because they don't let you use crosscut shred because that settles down into the bottom of the box and it won't burn. So you need cross, non crosscut line shred paper so that you can make it all nice and fluffy in the box and make it burn really well. And there's only one place in the country that still has one of those shredders that will produce it at, in 500 pound bales. And you can buy them from them for $300. And they ship them to you. And that's what we did. Containerized is 33 boxes. Uh, the surface burn is J with a little bit of gasoline in it to make it easier to light. And then the aerosol can test is a mixture of propane, ethanol, and water pressurized to 240 PSI, and then uh, we have a fast-acting valve that allows us to let out that mixture into the chamber to test whether or not we can quell an overpressure event. So what's the figure of merit? Well, what you have to do is you have to measure the maximum temperature way up there at the top, and you have to measure the time temperature integral. So it's minutes over temperature. And you ignite, you get to 200 degrees, you wait for one minute. So why are they doing all these things, right? Well, they're waiting for one minute so that the fire gets going real good so that you aren't doing an irrelevant test. You want to really stretch the system. Now, on an aircraft, if the smoke detector in the cargo compartment goes off, it hits it with halon, and it's done. It never gets to anything even remotely like 200 degrees. But they want to be super aggressive with the fire and super safe with the suppression, right? So you wait a minute, then you get to put it out. Now it's all the way up at 400 degrees. You hit it with the halon or whatever the suppression agent is. The temperature drops off because you've got a whole bunch of expanding gas, and that makes it cooler. So expanding gases cool the atmosphere. And then the temperature continues to rise for a little while as the suppression agent is quelling the fire. And then you measure this time temperature integral uh, for the 28 minute period. And that's what you report to the FAA. And that's, that's the figure of merit. That's how you pass or you don't. So how do you actually pass? Well, what you do is you measure it five times with halon, which means that you have to pump a whole bunch of halon out of the atmosphere to make a baseline, and then you go and test your new agent, and you have to be lower than the average of five runs plus one standard deviation. So that's the cutoff, right? So you got to have a big box. You got to have a box that's as big as a double aisle aircraft. So think of 777 aircraft, big wide airplane, Cargo compartment is 13 feet wide, five and a half feet high, and 33 feet long. And it looks like that. And it's basically an inside out boat. 
the inside surface is entirely sealed. So it's solidly welded all the way through. And this is where being a, a better engineer is a better thing to be because you're going to light a fire in there. And if you don't make sure that that skin can expand separate from all those stiffeners, you're going to rip all your welds off and destroy your test fixture during your first fire. So fortunately, I've been in both fires before, <laughs> or not. And um, so we space out all of the skip welds that hold the skin onto those ribs far enough so that the skin could expand and not rip off all the welds. And uh, we were so glad we did that because it got real hot. So what do you need for fire? Well, you need some fuel. We got all those boxes in there, right? Or, or jet fuel or whatever. And you need to get air in. So at the corners, here and here and up there, we have openings. And then on the sidewall, there's a triangular-shaped chamfer that makes it look like the inside of an airplane that has a whole bunch of holes in it. We put elbows in those holes so that stuff wouldn't fall down inside our air plums. And we bring in air at 50 cubic feet per minute. So the air exchange rate on like a 737 or something like that is really, really low, way below this. But again, they want to stress the system with a higher flow rate. So they provide 50 cubic feet per minute of air to the fire so that it will burn. So I got a little bit curious while we were setting this part of it up. And I thought, well, at 50 CFM, that means that I'll have when air exchange in X number of minutes. And I wonder if that's enough oxygen to burn 173 boxes full of paper. And I um, sat down and calculated, well, if all of that paper is made out of pure cellulose and that number of carbon atoms weighs this amount, and I would need this amount of oxygen to burn it. And it turned out that there was only really enough oxygen in there to burn about 15 boxes. But we're still 10 times the flow rate that would be on an aircraft. So this is a very, very conser conservative test. And really, the rest of those 173 boxes are just taking up space. They're just filling the compartment with things that look approximately like luggage and that have trapped air inside them, which turns out to be an important factor. So you got to get air out. So you have this tube that's got holes in the surface of it. Remember what that looks like. It's important later. We pull at 50 CFM. How do you maintain 50 CFM? I'll show you that in the next slide. Just a big engineering problem, right? And the, fortunately, there's lots of nice engineers around to help us. The other thing you need to be able to do is you need to be able to cool those gases down so that you can make measurements of the flow rate and all those kinds of things to know that you're actually at 50 CFM and you don't want to contaminate all those measurement devices with all of the tar and water and ash and everything else that you're going to produce during the fire, right? Because, I mean, it's basically like standing in your fireplace, <laughs> right? You know, it's really unpleasant. It's really, really dirty. You'll see in a minute here. Um, so um, I designed this thing that lets the air out through the side and then it comes up through these stacks and with all the surface area it cools the gases down and it lets all the ash settle out and you can empty it out through the bottom. It's just like having a little clean out on the bottom of your, of your chimney, right? And old fashioned chimneys had those. Now we don't have those. But uh, I'm an old fashioned person. So um, to modulate to 50 CFM we've got a great big scrubber that pulls air through at about 15,000 CFM. We need to ratchet that down. So first thing we did was make the tubes small so that we slowed the airflow down. And then we allowed a big inlet for gross metering, a small inlet for fine metering, and then another big inlet if we needed to open it to suck all the air out of the chamber and quell the fire quickly. And uh, it works good. You can tune right on. And um, guys like George 
will really love the data from that. I'll show you in one minute because it's crisp, really nice. So this is me and Noel in there. Every time we went in after we had done our first fire, you basically had to wear a self-contained breathing apparatus because the place was so heinous that it would be like licking the inside of your, you know, uh, fireplace. It's just terrible place to have to work. So every day in the suit, in the self-contained breathing apparatus, it was really, I mean, comical, really. Um, and, um, and no way to get around it. You'll get the idea here in a minute. Uh, the other thing you got to do is protect against overpressures that are really spontaneous. So if you get a big explosion in there from your aerosol can test, you better have a toilet lid type uh, valve like this one that has a little mass on top of it that keeps the pressure in the chamber from going over about 0.25 PSI because otherwise you're going to blow the doors off the thing. And you don't want that to happen because that's dangerous. There's lots of safety aspects, lots of personal protective equipment, lots of overpressure protection, those kinds of things. So here's where the data gets really crisp. So what you do to find out if you're actually getting 50 CFM is you, you, you measure it with a PO tube, which is a device, but you want to make sure that that PO tube is perfectly calibrated. And it's calibrated in the laboratory, but then you get it out there and you get tar all over it and stuff. So we did CO2 leak down tests all the time. And this is the perfect example of a CO2 leak down test, where you can take the exponent, multiply it by the total volume of the chamber, and get exactly 50 CFM. And the data and the fit to the data give you an R squared of 1, which is a perfect fit to the data. So it's just dead nuts on, everything worked exactly as we had designed it, right? So there was this uh, VP at Illumina named Arnold Oliphant, and Arnold always would say, you have to make the dirt road first. You got to be able to get from point A to point B and make sure that you're going to be successful before you go about improving your system and automating your, Mary Lynn is not smiling because we both know Arnold, and make sure that everything is going to work beginning to end before you go about automating and improving and upping your throughput and upping your success rate and so on. So a bunch of people did a bunch of experiments where they took propane, they mixed it with oxygen, they put it in a bowl, and they put in different agents and they lit them on fire and they showed that the agents quelled the fire in a well-mixed environment. Typical laboratory experiment. There's another laboratory experiment where people do cup burners, which George knows all about, um, or flame tubes to see how fast the flame front moves, those kinds of things. All those tests got done, and they were all successful for the alternative reagent that I'm going to tell you about. So the alternative reagent is CF3I. It's a carbon with three fluorines and an iodine on it. And the way we measure the application of it to the fire is by mass. So we do mass flow rate. We just have a scale on the tank, and as we let out the uh, reagent over time, we're measuring that and we're calculating constantly a flow rate over time. It comes out through nozzles that are sensitive to back pressure and the viscosity of the liquid and the velocity of the liquid and all of those kinds of things. And this little nozzle is, I'm sorry that top image is so weak, but um, the Material comes out, hits a little chamfer, and then spreads out in the whole chamber so that you get lots of vaporization because that's what you want. You want the gas everywhere. It's a gaseous material, right? And then you go about collecting all of this data that you need. And what you need is you need a lot of pressure data. You need a lot of thermocouple data. You need a lot of temperature data. And so the FAA um, wants 35 thermocouples on the ceiling and the sidewalls, and then we put on about another 30 of those on all of our equipment to make sure that we weren't destroying our carefully designed and built machine. You need to pull gases out and analyze them, 
And in our case, we had to filter and refrigerate and refilter and so on before they, uh, those gases went to our analytical instruments. And we're measuring uh, CF3, which is the active uh, end of the molecule that's easily monitored. Um, and CO2, carbon monoxide, and oxygen during the process. And we have a fancy little machine called an Environonics gas mixer that allows us to calibrate the instrumentation every day. So every single day we ran a calibration to make sure that we knew that the concentrations of the gases and so on were appropriate. We also needed to collect acid gases because it's known that as these reagents fall apart, Halon 1301 and CF3I both, they'll produce some acids, HI and HBr. In the case of Halon 1301, it's HBr. Hydrobromic acid. And uh, you need to know what those concentrations are because some of the gases that are in the cargo compartment might make their way up onto the passenger level, right? It's not likely because of the way we design airplanes, but it is possible, right? And then you need to have a fire suppression system that's in addition to that so you can put the whole thing out when you're done and recycle the chamber and that sort of thing so we have a water suppression system. So the thing looks like this when it's done. It's a big metal box. It's got a scaffolding around it and some steps that go up the side so that you can get up on top of the thing and change out thermocouples and move valves around and all kinds of things like that. We, we got this built in two months, which at Boeing is a miracle. Right. You know, I mean, you just, it's 178,000 employees, right? Nothing moves that fast. So we started in December, and at the, before the end of February, we were completely done with construction. So really fast. But that was because there was somebody for continuity the whole time, and that was me. So that's, the, that's my claim to fame on this thing. So... Um, we did an unsuppressed fire, and um, the manufacturer, the guy who built the box for us uh, is a big fab company that builds lots of uh, fixturing for Boeing, and they said, you know, we didn't cure the paint because it's too big to fit in our oven, and I said, oh, we'll cure it, and first fire, we cured it, man. You could just smell the, the solvent coming off the paint like crazy, and, uh, and all that telltale amine uh, background, right? And it's amazing. It's 2,000 degree taint, uh, paint. It's really, really good paint. And, uh, but it did get cured. <clears throat> and then we went about building our halon baseline so we'd know what we were going to com compare to. And then we started testing our new reagent, which is the CF3I material, right? So why did we think that CF3I would be a good material? Well, it's right below bromine on, so halon 1301 is the one on the left, CF3BR, and the one on the right is CF3I. They're right in line with one another. They're both halogens. They both have been demonstrated by other folks that have done testing to be effective. There's a company called Saval that puts out fires on the tops of fuel tanks that have floating lids at refineries with CF3I. So we knew that it was going to be good for fuel fires. And there was lots of reasons to think that CF3I was going to be perfect for what we needed to be able to do. And we had all these laboratory tests that said that it put out propane and oxygen fires in a metal ball. So the first test is this aerosol can test. Here's my aerosol can tester here on the right-hand side, a little schematic of it. It's got a bunch of pipe fittings and stuff. It's got a fast-acting valve at the bottom that can open a tenth of a second or so. And you bring this thing up to pressure by heating it up with a heat tape, and it's well insulated and holds that temperature and pressure. And then you go poof into the chamber and you shouldn't see any flames and we didn't and we didn't see any pressure rise either there's a little lump down here at the bottom so here's a completely uh, no ignition source on the left so no igniter on 
and you see the pressure go up and then the pressure drops off because there's a lot of adiabatic or uh, a lot of cooling from the expansion of the gas and on the right hand side we see this little tiny lump about 0.5 seconds after the release of the agent and that's a little tiny pressure rise but it's smaller than the pressure rise from the aerosol can itself so nobody cares about it right? it's too small so all is well we're riding high we've just finished our first fight we did five of these in a row all of them worked exactly the same no flames no weird behavior no pressure rises all is good and uh we, there's all five of them laid on top of one another. Every once in a while, you got that little wiggle. A lot of the time, you didn't. Pretty flat. Pretty flat behavior. So then we went on to our pan fire, which we knew was going to work great because people already use it on locomotives. In Australia, they use it. And they use it on fires uh, for fuel stations and all kinds of things like that. So very confident that it was going to work. Sure enough, it did. All of these guys here are the ones for uh, CF3I, and all these are the ones for Halon. It actually does a slightly better job than Halon does. It puts the fire out faster if you spray it right on the fuel fire. Works good. And, uh, and then uh, here's a Halon 1301 cargo fire. And again, we use that same method crosses 200 degrees, wait for a minute, let the agent go, puts the fire out. These, this is actually boxes tipping over and exposing more oxygen, right? Because the box is full of oxygen, right? It's full of air. So the box tips over, catches the corner on fire, and empties the oxygen out onto it, and you get little peaks, and that peak was well below the average plus one standard deviation from the halon test. So we passed. So then we uh, measured acid gases from Halon. And we found that they were roughly, you know, this, this time point in the acid gas concentration was always around 1,000 parts per million. And with the kinds of air handling systems that we have in aircraft, that's completely acceptable. When a fire happens in an aircraft, the first thing that happens is the flow through the cargo compartment is shut off. So only air from the outside is coming in. It's going out through some overboard valves. And the air that's coming into the passenger compartment is no longer being recycled through the cargo compartment. So the air handling system is helping you by letting you quell the fire, especially if you're at altitude and there's not much oxygen up at 35,000 feet. So 1,000 ppm of HF and, uh, and 1,600 ppm of hydrogen bromide. And that's been working for 60 years. So then we did a CF3I test. And during the very first one, the temperature last, the high temperature after letting the agent go stayed high for too long and it failed. And uh, it's this point right here that made it fail. The highest thermocouple of all those thermocouples that were in the chamber got too hot and we failed the maximum temperature test against Halon. It was too high. And we all thought, well, darn, that's bad. This looks like the agent is promoting the fire. And that's just really irritating, you know, because we knew that it worked for these other cases so well. And then we measured the acid gases. And they were, so the passing criterion that we agreed to with the FAA was that it was in the same order of magnitude as that for Halon. So if we had come out with something between zero and 
10,000 ppm, we probably would have been okay. <laughs> and George is looking at it and going, that looks like 93,000 parts per million to me. Yeah, that's right. It totally failed. Okay, so I'm a molecule, right? And over there is the fire front at the board, and I get sprayed out, and I'm moving through the room, and it's getting hotter and hotter. And the place where halon lets off its bromine is way over here. It lets off its bromine, it produces a bromine atom, and there starts to be a catalytic cycle of bromine and HBr and a couple of other compounds that rotate around and around. The bromine doesn't get consumed, and it quells the fire by killing the flame front. It's the actual chemical reaction that's happening at the flame front that gets quelled by the bromine from CF3Br. CF3I starts over here, and it gets about this far, and the iodine falls off. And it gets about this far, and one fluorine falls off. And it gets about this far, and another fluorine falls off. And it gets this far, and another fluorine falls off. And there's only a couple of oxidizers in chemistry that are more potent at oxidizing fuel, which is what we've got. We've got this burning fire that's gasifying all these paper boxes. So you've got this super fuel heavy environment. There's only a couple things that are better at oxidizing things than oxygen is. One of them is fluorine and the other one is HF. <laughs> and we produce giant quantities of both, right? And a massive purple cloud of iodine because before the iodine ever got to the fire, it turned into I2, which is purple and heavy. And it just got pumped out all over the place on the chamber because it also caused an overpressure in the, in the chamber. So <clears throat> the red line is our agent. So the agent comes out, and it starts increasing, in, and the temperature falls off increasing in concentration and the temperature falls off, everything is great. And then it gets up to this point right here where that concentration is the predicted concentration from the mass that we let go. And all of a sudden it starts falling like crazy. And the concentration of the dotted purple line, which is CO2, starts going up like crazy. We were burning the agent. We were turning the agent into CO2 and all of those fluorines that were coming off were promoting the temperature rise because they were oxidizing the fuel-rich environment and not doing what we expected it to do. So this is why testing at full scale is sometimes super important because we had actually done the homework on the laboratory scale stuff. Not that there weren't laboratory scale things that we could have done that might have outed this problem. There are. Now, that I ha can look back on it, I can predict what those might be and we'll go about doing some of those tests, right? But we had done our homework. We were pretty confident that we were going to make it all the way through this thing and this was going to be the next agent. And no. So the really bad part is that with all of that fuel floating around, you've got all these carbohydrates in the gas phase, basically floating around in this chamber. It's hotter than hell in there. And they're floating around in there, and now you fluorinated all of them. And without anything to maintain the monomer state, like a really high concentration of methanol, as an example, or even more water might have done it, um, they start forming polymers. So remember that big tube, the one that had all the holes in it? It filled all of them with solid material that was about the hardness of pencil lead and has a huge carbohydrate signature in the IR. So I broke off pieces of it and did IR spectroscopy so I could see that there was carbohydrates in it. Carbohydrates are what the boxes are made out of. And it clogged up one-inch holes and clogged up the four-inch tube for eight feet. Eight feet of solid material just completely filling that thing. 
we had to use my, so I used to be a pipe fitter, and so I've got a great big auger at home. And I had to go home and get my auger and bring it into work so that we could auger out the pipes because they were so clogged with this solid material that we didn't have anything at, you know, on site at Boeing that could gouge the stuff back out of there again. It was really just a complete mess. It took several days to clean this up. I spent a lot of time in the yellow suit and one test. I had just cleaned it. <laughs> That's one test. It was bare metal the day before. So a bunch of the other talks that I've given at Rain have been, you know, living in the land of unintended consequences, <laughs> which I think those of you who've seen the other ones um, will recognize. This was really unintended consequence. So this agent has now failed. This data has all been presented to the FAA at the triennial and to the working group that includes Airbus and EASA and FAA and so on. And, uh, and now we're down to one last agent that w ultimately will probably make our airplanes weigh three or 400 extra pounds. And we will be taking off with that weight every day, every flight for the next how long airplanes last, man, they're 60 years old and they're still flying. Uh, and they'll be contributing to greenhouse gases because the agencies that control the strings on the use of halon will not relent in their uh, opinion that no one should use halon despite of its efficiencies. It's an interesting problem, right? So that's the really cool part, is that it's not persistent in nature hardly at all. It's 3,300 times more labile than CF3BR is. Its half-life in the atmosphere is less than seven days. So 65 years versus seven days, you know, really big difference. You can see it just like in the tubes where I would exhaust the CF3I uh, while I was filling bottles or whatever. Um, those tubes are normally made out of like nylon or whatever, and there was enough sun, sun getting through them where it would break down the agent in the tubes and turn the tubes purple. You know, so it breaks down pretty fast. Um, so the expectation was the ozone strike was going to be minimal, and that the you know uh, the weight was going to be good. It was going to be marginally heavier. Uh, the one that we're stuck with now is a lot heavier. <laughs> now, you know, that's not true. They really, they did work on it hard, but they worked on it with a lot of technologies, you know, like air scrubbers that promote nitrogen. And that's actually how we inert the, um, the fuel tanks on airplanes. We have a device called an air separator module that takes the oxygen out of air and delivers the nitrogen side of it to the fuel tanks, um, but they are not dispatch critical. So what does that mean? That means that if one of those units is not working correctly, we can still take off, right? And why is that? Well, first of all, they're unreliable, and second of all, the air above the tank was already filled with nitrogen from the previous flight, so you don't need to worry about that, right? So we can fly with a non-dispatch critical system on board, and that's, that's hunky-dory. But to make enough nitrogen to inert the entire fuselage, they just simply are not reliable enough for that yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the customers really love it. Yeah, it's the, the headaches, the nausea, you know, it's all really good, yeah. Altitude sickness. What pressure is the, uh, no, it's okay, thanks. What pressure is the vessel? Oh, yeah, so uh, for the fire tests, no. 
But um, to make the nozzles work right, the pressure inside the tanks that hold the agent has to be boosted way up. Um, Halon 1301's vapor pressure is about 207 PSI, fairly good. The um, pressure for CF3I is quite a bit lower, it's only about 70 PSI, so pretty low. So that's not enough to push it out of the thing fast enough to really quell a fire. So we actually pressurized those bottles, which are titanium, uh, at about 800 PSI to push it all out into the aircraft really, really fast. And, and that's why Halon is so effective, right? And in fact, on engines, we do that in like one second. So we dispense the entire bottle in one second. You know, they've, they've gotten a little bit of a pass because um, the big hitter is the Navy. Um, and, you know, so national defense gets a little bit of a pass on stuff. But um, ultimately, everybody's going to have to have something. Yep, they've got another constraint, and that is that they've got humans on board. And so you really can't use, let's say, 80% CO2, 20% 2 BTP as an example, because you're going to kill everybody on board <laughs> with the 80% CO2. Because to get CO, for CO2 to be effective, it's got to be really high concentration, way higher than humans can take. So, well, they have some advantages. I mean, the Navy has some advantages. Um, one is that they, they're nuclear powered most of them, and they have an unlimited supply of power, and they can run inerting systems all the time, and they have relatively well-sealed vessel, vessels. So I would, I, I'm not, I don't know, but I would bet that the Navy is looking more at the inerting aspect of it than, than aircraft has done. It's the, the pressure changes and all the air changes and all that stuff with airplanes is just really a bummer. Absolutely, it's all takeoff and landing stuff that people are concerned about. Because at altitude, at 35,000 feet, you just open it up and it fires out, you know. But it's on the it's on the uh, takeoff and landing that you're always concerned about. It. So there's some real challenges, and there's some magic molecules out there like halon. It has all these great benefits. It's clean. It doesn't kill humans until it gets up to really high concentrations. It puts out fires like crazy. It's just strong enough to get all the way to the fire front, you know, to, to, to actually release its bromine and, and do its job. So its dynamics are really excellent. And uh, yeah, it's a hard game. Yes. Can you repeat that question? Yeah, so she's asked whether or not our third option uh, was, was she said, it's heavy, yes, true, uh, but at least is it better to the atmosphere? And the answer is yes. So we're, we're still going to achieve the ozone goal, but probably not the CO2 goal. Very well, yes. So in the face of experiments like this one, yeah. that can possibly result in reducing global gate feed in carbon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll tell you, man, uh, the company that provided the CF3I, they were literally on an airplane back home within three hours of the final test. It was just like, abandon ship. Every, you know, it was really rough, you know, and we all just felt like crap um, because we were really hoping that this was going to be the one. You know, because it was such a good plug-in. We didn't need to redesign systems. We didn't have to change the size of tubes. We'd be able to retrofit the aircraft easily. This, the, the third option, right, means retrofitting the aircraft in a really burdensome way. That, you know, it's a bummer.
you know, that's interesting because the folks that do Halon recycling do it from all kinds of different vessels, right? They'll get a vessel in that only has a little puddle on the bottom and, you know, 100 PSI or, or there's no puddle and 100 PSI of Halon above it. And they have to be able to recycle that just as much as they would recycle something that's still liquid form that they can pump out with a, with a, uh, with a, a liquid pump, right? And so they do. They, they condense it, right? And um, for things that are on the ground, that would make sense, right? A refrigeration system that can condense the halon back into liquid form. It's relatively easy because it, 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 it boils at a pretty high temperature, so relatively easy. It's okay. Yeah. Well, the reason that CF3I kind of became a juicy subject was that the electronics industry loves it as a, um, uh, a chip etcher. And so all of a sudden, the electronics industry started requiring more and more and more CF3I for their operations, which made the price come down a whole bunch. Because it had been like 500 bucks a pound, and now it's down to about 80 bucks a pound. And, and Halon is about $35 a pound. So it was getting closer and closer in cost because there are many other uses for it not just putting out fires, right? It's a refrigerant, right? No, so the alternative agent is a mixture. Yeah, an 80-20 mixture of two different agents. And um, there has been some thought that maybe CF3I in a mixture environment would perform better, but you're still then at high mass. That's one of the